Uh, so I, I, I wanted to um, uh, just give a talk about how I position uh, video in technology today, et cetera, and uh, you know, how I think about it both historically and you know, kind of why it is that I position myself the way that I do. And I'd like to start off, uh, I want to dedicate this uh, story to John, John Watt. He's been very interested in the, uh, in the more or less the cult of McLuhan, the, uh, the McLuhan Center and the people that are there. And, and uh, I myself have an interesting relationship with McLuhan because when I was um, really just finishing up my undergraduate degree, I was going to school in Michigan. And around the Ann Arbor area, McLuhan used to, you know, used to run around that territory quite a bit. And uh, it was really at the height of his his time before he was really well known, so around 65, 66. So of course he had read, he had written the book Understanding Media um, in 1964. He published it, and um, uh, it's an amazing it's an has, it's an amazing book in terms of insights in terms of technology. So I was aware of McLuhan was really into McLuhan uh, in the late 60s, and then of course as a young person I thought he would become very passe. So when I lived here and I actually had access to McLuhan, I really was like Andy McLuhan. There was nothing that he could offer me, et cetera. And uh, around 1975, I had a friend at the time, his name was Scott Didlake. And Scott Didlake was from Crystal Springs, Mississippi, and he lived in, in, in Toronto. And uh, as an expatriate American, uh, he had really benefited from coming to Toronto and had done really well until around 1974 when people realized that there were too many of us. That there were about 100,000 Americans living in downtown Toronto. And that we were taking all the jobs because we were a little more aggressive. And we were, you know, part of a colonial force that was, and, and Scott couldn't hide, you know. He, he was from Mississippi, so he had a real thick accent. So he was just all of a sudden out of luck because he couldn't get any work. And, uh, but Scott was a smart, he was really a smart guy. And, and he said, uh, Tom, we ought to go down to see Marshall McLuhan. He's just down there at the UD. We can see him. And I, I'd say, Scott, well, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Because I was saying, I don't know, not only because I wasn't into McLuhan, but I had been out of the university environment. I thought U of T was a nest of intellectuals and that I would be kind of common for it. So I was really reluctant to move from the street to the university context. And so Scott kept badgering me and he said, look, we'd go over to the coach house. He has this regular gig on Monday nights. I think it was. We'd go down, we'd go down a little early, we'd just sneak in there, won't be a big deal. So anyways, we go down early. It's like a six o'clock start or something. We're there at 5.30. We open the door and Marshall McLuhan standing in the door. And he says, well, who do we have here? Who do we have here? Like uh, Marshall McLuhan. He hands his hand to, to uh, Scott, and Scott, and he said, what do you do, Scott? So I said, well, I'm a filmmaker, my name's Scott Diddley. And he said, well, Scott, I can tell you from, you're from the South. Where, where are you from in the South? And Scott told me, he said, and what kind of film do you do? And Scott said, well, I do uh, social documentary. I, I'm, I'm a, I specialize in the monopod because I can run away. When the police come in and club us, I can run away, right? And Marshall's listening to everything else. He said, well, come in, Scott, come in. And he turns and he looks at me and he's got his, you know, complete, his plaid suit on and you know, double breasted and everything else. And he says, oh, hello, Marshall McLuhan, what's, what's your name? What, what? I said, Tom Sherman. He said, well, what do you do, Tom? I said, I'm a, a video artist. First time I'd ever said it. Marshall McLuhan looked at me and he said, without, well, it was pretty quick. He said, well, you're a walking, talking oxymoron if I've ever met one. <laughs> <laughs> All I heard was a moron. <laughs> And I was sort of humiliated by this experience. And I shook hands with him and I thought, geez, I, I knew I should have come here. And, and, and we, we had an amazing evening, and, but we never went back. That's all I want to remember. We never went back. But I remember that moment, it kind of fixed me. And I, I was trying to think the whole time of the, the seminar that evening what he meant. You know? like, what was an oxymoron? You know? And I, I decided that during that session, my interpretation of what he meant was is that the combination of art and video was pretty useless, right? Because I, he's saying that I was going to have some trouble in my life. 
this was not going to be an easy path. And, and uh, he believed that, that part of, of, of the structure of art was obsolescence. So he said, what you want to do is you want to associate yourself with a form that's coming obsolete in terms of other utilities. So in other words, used to be painting, used to be a political platform, but it now is an art platform. So when you look at a painting, you know what you're there for. You're not there because they're running an election on a painting, but they used to. Right? So video was going to be, he was, what he was trying to say to me is, is that it's ascendant now. I had no idea that it would be continually ascending and it would be an elusive structure. So then I started to think, well, what did, you know, this is after the meeting, what, what, what happened with video? What did video obsolesce and what did, um, what was an uh, obsolesce by video? And I thought, well, obviously, probably the internet has made video to a certain degree in terms of not a primary technology. And I would think, you know, like uh, maybe film had been obsolesced by video initially. The irony being is once video, once film was vacated, then all the filmmakers moved into video. And they kind of, there's an avalanche of people who are making film, but they're making video, right? So I started to think about all that, and I, you know, I, I did reinvest a lot of time in reading McLuhan in terms of all that. But the, the key thing is, is that Video as a technology has held my fascination, in part because of the fact that it is always escaping obsolescence. Mm -hmm. and, and when you look at the stats, you know, and you look at the fact that video has been become the primary uh, mechanism of the phone right, in the interactive culture, and what better place for me to see it go, because I like to talk and watch video. <laughs> and the film, and the, and the camera is really beautiful for that, a mobile camera. And if you look at the network statistics on that, there's a company called Cisco Systems. They make all the video servers in the world. They do this, they do this international survey. And you know, the, the stats are always incomprehensible. They're like how many cigarettes end to end go to the moon, they're kind of those kinds of stats. But some of the stats are crazy, including the fact that in 2020, there will be a million minutes of video created every second. And the big growth area is mobile telephony. It's, it's really happening in Africa. It's really happening in the Middle East. And it's really, really happening in China. So we see a tremendous amount of vernacular use of image and sound, visual information encoded in network video, and, and acoustic information together. So you know, it, it, it's kind of like to work in an area like that, you've got some competition. Not to mention the other competing areas, but this is a—it's a totally ascendant technology. So that notion that he had about obsolescence—it's probably going to be difficult to get an audience for an artist making video if they focus too much on that. It's probably going to have to be called something else, which it is usually. Okay, so that's 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 the start, and I, I think that's a kind of a pretty important uh, aspect of what I've been work, working with and what I've been working in the context of. Now the, the, the second thing I would say is, is that uh, I, I really have been very interested in the idea that, that video as a technology is so primary in terms of its ability to present point of view and to be able to present perceptual records, uh, so to speak. And I mentioned earlier, it, it's, it's kind of a crazy thing that these people at retail had this notion that they would essentially have an archive of perceptual records by individuals who were essentially bucking or were, were being elusive in terms of the conventions of the society. So the society, first through mass communication and later through various surveillance structures and feedback mechanisms, which are all cybernetic, essentially as a system, they engineer relative conformity in terms of the production of perception and the reporting of perception. So the artist, first of all, is put in a very funny position because the artist is essentially an outlier within that system while, it's, while that person is in the, in, the, in the thick of it. So one of the things that I was really interested always in video is, is that it's a, it's a really a beautiful uh, primary example of a cognitive accelerator. So if my, if my videos are good, they involve you seeing how I think and they, they ask you or they evoke you to think with me. 
So cognition is a very interesting idea. It's the idea of, uh, of using your brain and your perspective and creating a kind of a mental understanding of a situation. And video accelerates that because video is operating with the idea of light. It's operating at the speed of light. And even with the resistance of the technology and the electrical function of the technology, it's still operating at about half the speed of light, which is like infinitely faster than we operate. As bioelectrical computers, we operate really fast, but we're really in lag. You're listening to me at another time than when I'm speaking. There's a, there's a lag. We're, we've adjusted to that lag. We're not as fast as the video camera. But not only is the video camera fast, the video camera can be in the environment as a second world. It can double the, the world, and that's why that crazy statistic about a million seconds, and it's like, it, it gets even weirder. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's, it's five, you know, five million hours per month. It, it, it has this crazy relationship with real time, right? But video is there, it's operating faster than I'm operating and that you're operating. And not only that, it's, it's, it's perceiving the world as a model of consciousness, and it's also making a notation of that world at a speed that we're not even capable of understanding. We, we, can only, we, we only know it's a good thing when we get on our hands. So it's, it's, it's experiencing perception right at the moment. And then as we experience perception, it has already done a descriptive passage of that in, in a millisecond. So that's a crazy thing. That's a lot different than if a bat flew into this room and I had a notepad and I watched it and then I was trying to do a drawing. It's quite a slow process. That's cool, the deceleration is cool. It's really good that people do paint. I hang around with painters. They are the slowest people. Light hits them at light speed, and they take months, years sometimes, to represent that. Video is that it just compresses it in the middle of the right? That's why it's a push button technology, and everybody thinks it's not powerful, but that's powerful. And then if you take a lot of that a lot of that cognitive activity, and you begin to stack it up a little bit, you can make some fairly elegant perceptual pictures, right? describing point of view, and that's why the technology is so valuable. It allows people to place themselves in space and to manipulate time, etc. So that, that cognitive, cognitive acceleration is very exciting to me. It's also very interesting the fact that it still has the function of at least a tolerable level of deceleration. Because I don't have the patience to do a painting over a year's time. Right? Just that, that, that amount of deceleration doesn't interest me. But the deceleration is involved with stacking those cognitive descriptions. So cognition involves uh, the realization that something's happening, right? And then putting that into memory, whether we do that organically, right? And then it sets up an understanding of what might come next. It sets up an expectation. That's one of the things that's crazy about the video technology is that it kind of allows us to pre-perceive what it is we're doing by the fact that we do it on a regular basis. That's what's so important about the vernacular use. When people are using their phones to communicate and they're sending acoustic and visual passages that are, that are essentially gathered and they're, they're communicating that way, that's going to lead them to have expectations and it's going to lead them to be forward thinking in terms of change. Right? And that's why when people get into the video mirror, they, it escalates their change. They change the way they look. They like it. It's a kind of an action technology. Now, I've been helped along this way of thinking by a couple, in, in particular, by a couple of philosophers. Um, uh, one, one would be uh, uh, Merleau-Ponty, Merleau who as a phenomenologist was a kind of an existential phenomenologist. And he really understood that when you look at data from a phenomenological point of view, you can't help but getting into other layers of interpretation and cognition. Right? So he really recognized that you can't just do matter of fact. But, but he really understood that when you have a camera with you, right, or when you're dealing with a camera, you're dealing with a form of notation, you find yourself phenomenologically in a position 
of being in the world, but not being particularly aware of it. But what happens is that there are patterns in the world, there are things in the world that occur that allow you to become aware of the experience of perception. And then it's really important to carry a notebook around. It's really important just to shoot some video. It's really important to, to describe that activity. And then once you begin to do that, of course, you then can look at the mediation and see that that activity is primary. So what you're seeing in the world, in that second world, you can look at that second world and it becomes primary, and you can go through and you can cascade. And that way you can build cognitive experiences into a construction that allows you to take a more personal approach, or a more eccentric approach, in terms of the way you model perception. Right? Now, there are other people that are even uh, more radical, and there's another person that, that was given to me by an archaeologist friend. Uh, uh, this man named James uh, Jerome uh, Gibson. And he was a perceptual psychologist, but a complete radical. He believed that there was no essential need to understand the cognitive patterns of the way people looked at things when they looked at the world, that the world had enough information itself to be satisfying. And he, he ended up with, he formulated a theory called direct perception or ecological perception, which is that all we really need to do is to stay on the surface and to operate in a way like a video camera. And he is behind most of the people who are building machines who are going to other planets, who I mentioned earlier, when you send a Mars rover uh, to Mars. You don't have to carry the human intelligence in a large, artificially intelligent creature. All you need for that creature to be able to do is to be able to negotiate the world to not fall over, to make recordings of important things, to recognize things. And a lot of the artificial intelligence research that's spatial is following that. Gibson was really important in the formation of almost all of the flight simulators and things like that. But the psychologists hate him because of the human conceit and people wanting to understand psychology as this cluster of, of, of activities. And, and those, that cluster is maybe for other art forms. Right? But for video technology, what's been exciting about it for me is, is that I've been able to stay in the world and at least occasionally, if not often, right, go with that device in, in a cyborgian sense and allow it to help me see the world, help me to understand and to experience the world, and help me make notation of the world, and help me to begin to build and to cascade, etc. So that's really, really, really been an, an effective technology. Now, the, the most important thing, I think, is, is that uh, Within the conventions and the vernacular use, it could be possible that, in fact, everybody is going to think the same way about the world because of their relationship with the technology. And it probably is leading us to look a certain way at the world. So in other words, uh, you know, I'm, when I'm looking at things I did, I'm thinking, geez, I wish I would have had a best, better camera. I wish I would have made that shot. I would have mixed, mixed my audio differently if I would have known that, you know, there are adjustments that want to be made. But the thing is, is that video by artists in particular, right, the attitude that artists have taken towards this technology and not the broadest vernacular user, has been that there, there really was a belief that it was possible to model cognition and perception in a way that defied the commonness of human perception. Uh, it's not that I want to be you know, special but I do believe that I do see the world differently than other people. I'm just going to hold that. You know, like some people think that's an unwise way to think, but, but I'm going to hold that. And I'm, I think it's possible that this archive, right, that's what's really going on here. It's, it's the differentiation of perception and perceptual modeling and perceptual passages, right? from the broader constructed reality. And that other construction right, is what is expected and not what is uncertain or unexpected. And it's, it's my role and other people who are working with that technology who believe that there are differences in the way we perceive the world right, to essentially model that. 
and that this place is probably as rich as any place on the planet in terms of that kind of model. It has a regional context, it's, it's Canadian, probably dominated by central Canadians, right? It has a time sweep that shows certain activities, but it shows where people are collectively, right, in its web. Right? The problem is, is that how do you get people to see what's there? <coughs> How do you index it in a way so that it can be read? And how do you reach what we, I mean, not to say we're referring to today, how do you reach the point where we reach when we watch trans video? It took quite a run up, it took a lot of personal history, it took a collection of people to do that, etc. But we did understand that we were in 1981 with Tom Sherman. And, and that was a pretty crazy experience. Now, that experience is not something for television or it's not something for Netflix, right? It's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different type of, of activity. So it may be, in a way, we have to go a little bit further. We almost have to automate the reading of that activity, right, and the comparison of that activity. And then we probably need help to try to understand it. And, and part of the help is we just don't have the time. We don't have the time to look at that archive. Right? And the time is getting more and more difficult to find. So that's, that's part of the thing. So what I would say is, is that video and the way that I look at it is a perceptual prosthetic. And I would, operate, uh, I, would, I would talk about that in terms of what I think McLuhan would have understood because I believe McLuhan was not interested in the commonality of things, but McLuhan was interested in difficult texts. He was interested in cognitive and perceptual modeling that was extremely, extremely complicated. And he was interested in building a structure to respect that. People think he was all about the internet and that he was some kind of a pre-seer and that he saw all of these things. But what he was really trying to do was respect and protect literature. And he was looking at the media environment as a negative thing. Uh, in the way that it was turning. He understood certain things that we would move towards orality. Uh, he was a seer, there's no question, and there's still unparalleled, there's no more brilliance than the way he looked at media at the time that he did. Um, but I think that those perspectives, that I, the idea of a perceptual is prosthetic, and why it's needed is, is that there's a certain amount of activity which is being conducted relative to the vernacular use of technologies and the state and the commercial enterprises and uh, the community, etc. but there's a certain level of expectation of commonness that has to be resisted. So we basically forget how to see differently. And that's one of the, that's one of the roles that I have to inhabit is, is that I have to try to, I have to try to continually refresh the way that I see and emphatically, even if, if I'm seeing the same way over and over again, which is possible, I think it's really important to not fall victim of the roboticization of perceptual model. And I, I, that could be really obvious, and I, you know, I, I'm going to be grasping now to try to come up with a model of that. But of course, the only danger is, is that in fact, when you're looking at that, the result of all the constructions. I, I use the, the case all the time. People are always talking about the imagination as if it's some kind of. Uh, an understood uh, phenomenon. But people believe that people are imaginative because they grew up as children watching the same movies. And we have, in, we have industrialized imagination. But I, I remember imagination the way, it was, the way it really is. I had a second grade teacher and I said something to her in class. And she looked at me and she said, Tommy, you have quite an imagination. And I knew just in that instant that she was not my friend. <laughs> that she didn't want me to not conform to what it is that I was, where I was supposed to fly. So that, that's a really interesting thing because that gets into structure. You know, earlier this week I went to a lecture by a psychologist and I talked to her during the lecture about J.J. Gibson's ideas of direct perception. And I told her that she had also, was also objecting to the fact that recess was taking away a lot of time from children and when they could be learning. 
so I made some talk about, I talked about direct reception with her and, and uh, she looked at me quizzically and then I said, if, if you really understood what I was saying, you'd let students go to, rec go to recess. And she looked at me and she told me, she said, first of all, that J.J. Gibson was a fraud because he dealing with, didn't deal with the congestion of upper level perceptual cognition, but that he was too data driven and bottom up, etc. He was too much like an insect, right? <laughs> Uh, in, in, in the way that it grows the world. And then she looked at me and she said, you know, unstructured play is not the place for children to be because they're not going to learn anything in that environment. And I thought, boy, we, we, you know, I'm right back in the second grade. She, she understood what the questions I was supposed to ask her. And, and so, so this, is a, this is a powerful way to deal with the world. And, and uh, and, and many times you can, you can essentially, in, in modeling perception, in terms of uh, the possibility of expectation, you can be at the surface of something, you can be to a certain degree a seer, not because you have special powers, but just because you're not looking at the present in the way that you're supposed to. And that's really the, that's the gift that video technology has given me and why it's held my attention and why I can't turn away from it. Um, uh, have I, do I approach things differently, et cetera, in terms of that prosthetic? But I do, I do believe that that prosthetic is necessary and it's necessary to give that to people. And of course, I would like the attention and I would like to be able to people to, to immediately understand what I'm doing and to be accessible, et cetera. But, you know, the most important thing for me is to is to uh, build on that cascade and to try to get better and better and to be right in the right space mentally and the right understanding in terms of my body in relationship to what's happening. To move that instrument and to use the instrument like people would use a telescope or a microscope, to use it as a perceptual instrument for the powers that it has. So that's, you know, what that's why I could never get over this, and that's why I keep I keep make, keep making work because I you know I'm never quite right, and I also always seem to see what I can't cover, even with this magnificent te uh, technology. Now, will the technology be obsolesced? You know, there's there's no uh, there's no doubt that the technology will be obsolesced and will fall back from its main position. Why is it so predominant? You know, it's pretty good. It hears like we hear in stereo, right? It sees like we do. Uh, you know, it has a single, you know, mostly a single image, but we're dealing with all kinds of 3D, 4D, virtual reality. There's a lot of attempts to try to upgrade this technology to see a little bit more like we do. But there's really nothing like it when you get right down to it and you're there alone in many cases with me and it's intimacy, and that's always what it's been known for, and it's process-oriented, you know, all of these signals have been here. It's about process, it's not about product, right? It's nice to see the beautiful resolution of HD video today compared to the fuzzy old three-quarter analog technology. Is it really different because it's, you know, there's a lot of questions to be answered. But when I'm right down with the perceptual technology of video, when I'm right there, and I sense what's going on, and I'm laying it down as a description as I'm working. And I really feel sometimes it's just like a movie, only better. Mm -hmm. <laughs>